Hey fearsome friends, I hope you all had a great Maybank holiday weekend, but now it's back to the grind. Here are 11 allegedly true creepy encounters for you to enjoy. So sit back, relax, and get cozy, comfy, warm, because it's time to let your nightmares in. So there was this guy, who I'll call Jimmy for this story, who I met in high school some years back. I met him through my now ex-boyfriend, and we hung out a lot during these classes, but never just the two of us. He was a really funny and charming guy, so it felt good to be around him, just chilling and laughing all the time. But little did I know who he really was under that facade. About a year went by after we'd graduated, and we hadn't really talked or seen each other since, when randomly he started sending me DMs on Instagram, and we got back in touch again. He had a girlfriend during this time, yet he kept flirting and saying sexual things to me. One day he even sent me nudes that I never asked for, which made me feel really disgusted and upset. On that same day, his then-girlfriend sent me a DM asking if he was doing these things, and he was. She then went on to make a group chat for the three of us, where she roasted him into oblivion. But he just continued sending us nudes in the group, which was really messed up. By that point, I finally lost my temper and just stopped talking to him completely. Then about a year after that whole debacle, I let him back into my life again. Yes, I know that was stupid of me, but I'm the type of person who forgives easily, because I only see the good in most people. We talked for a few days, when we realised we kind of had a crush on each other, and had done for a long time. This is when he started asking if I wanted to hang out at his place, just the two of us, which had never happened before. He admittedly gave me butterflies, so I said I'd think about it, just to be coy, when really I was planning on staying, on saying yes. However, that very quickly changed moments later. One of my very good friends, who I'll call Diane, asked me if I was friends with Jimmy. I said that I was, and why was she asking, when she then went on to tell me that Jimmy was a paedophile. Huh, what? I said. I was obviously really confused, considering for the most part he'd always been such a cool guy. Sure, he'd had some weird moments, but he was cool to hang around with. But then Diane showed me the evidence, and there was a lot of it. Apparently a whole group of underage girls had gotten together and shared their experiences with Jimmy in a group chat, which included Diane, because she had a family connection to one of the girls. Thank God there were no physical experiences, but there were so many texts, so, so many god-awful and disgusting texts. I can't go into what he actually said, as it's just too much but one of these girls was as young as 11 years old. After I'd seen all the evidence, I began to have a massive panic attack. This guy who I had been so close to, and who I'd almost started a relationship with, turned out to be a mega paedophile. It made me sick to my stomach, and it still makes me feel like puking to this day. I actually had felt things for that monster. I also found out that he had been on house arrest for some crime at one point, and he hadn't told me. I don't want to think about what crime he may have committed. I didn't even want to know. All I did know, though, was that I wanted this guy completely out of my life for good. So I told him he was a sicko and blocked him, and thankfully I haven't heard from him since, and hopefully never will again. I don't want to know what could have happened to me if we had met up alone in his house, but I feel like I definitely wouldn't have been safe. So this happened about 15 years ago when I was 18 and I used to work in a newsagent's cafe franchise in a large mall. We got a lot of creeps come in for some reason to the point that all of us girls stopped wearing makeup and tried to have the worst hairstyles to make us as unappealing as possible. So you can imagine the extent of the issue. I've always looked younger. 
I had to show my ID to buy alcohol until I was 30. So with no makeup, I probably looked about 15. One day, a creepy dad, who I'll call CD, came in with his son. CD was over 50, huge, bald, dressed all in biker-style leather, and the son was about my age and looked like a stereotypical nerd. Thin, tall, wearing glasses, and he was looking at his feet. Firstly, the dad asked to buy bus tickets. So I checked the drawer, which was pretty low, and I had to bend down to look. But I didn't see any. So I asked a co-worker to check if there were any in the back. She came back and said we were out. So I told CD that I was sorry, and that we didn't have any tickets at that moment. And here's where the creepiness begins. Oh, that's a shame, he said. Could you maybe look in the drawer again? You look so pretty when you bend over. Shocked by this, I just said, I'm sure we don't have any left, sir. Then I could see him looking at our cigarette shelf, which went up all the way to the ceiling. And he made this smug face, telling me he wanted Marlboros. They were at the very top, and I would have to get on a ladder to get them. But for that very reason, we had a box of cigarettes from top shelves under the counter. So I made a smug face back and pulled the Marlboros from there. Oh no, he said. I was hoping you'd get on the ladder and I'd have a better look at you. I was trying so very hard not to tell him where to go. When I said, Well, I have them here, so no need for the ladder. Shame. Oh, what's that pendant you have there, he said, whilst basically shoving his face into my cleavage. I jumped back, of course, and was now really uncomfortable. I now know that the easiest way out of it would have been to just ask a male colleague to take over. But it was my first job and I didn't know any better. So I didn't say anything, and just quickly packed his stupid cigarettes so I could get rid of him ASAP. In the meantime, his poor son was visibly embarrassed, pulled his sleeve once every so often and said, Dad, can we please just go? But the dad didn't react to him at all, didn't even look at him. Finally, with the cigarettes packed, I told him his total and he was paying. And as he was paying, he said, What time do you get off work tonight, honey? Along with a sleazy smile. The son was completely red in the face now and kept repeating, Dad, let's just go. But to no avail. By this time, something had finally clicked in my brain. And I remembered an interview with a beauty pageant contest. You read a lot of crap magazines working in a place like that who said her best way to blow off old creeps is to make them feel, well, old. So I smiled my most beautiful smile and said with a sweet, giggly voice, Oh, sir, I think you're even older than my daddy. Well, that did it. He became red, grabbed the sun and literally stormed out, dragging the kid behind him. He even left his cigarettes. So that was a silver lining for sure, because I'm a smoker. And since they were paid for and he didn't come back for them, my boss let me have them. Still, it was really creepy and I'm uncomfortable thinking about it even after 15 years. I'm also sorry for the kid, as he seemed nice and I can't imagine the embarrassment I'd have felt if my dad was hitting on and harassing girls my age. This happened a couple of years ago, when I was around 13 to 14 years old. I would go to Nerf Wars with my friends during the weekends, with a semi-auto rifle and one of those revolver-looking pistols as a sidearm. And on one of those occasions, I brought my girlfriend with me. Now for some context, my girlfriend's neighbour lives in the same area as I do, and I've known her for some time, from around preschool I think. So as you do for a Nerf War, you pack up spare darts and spare mags, etc. And it was after the Nerf War ended, and we'd had a great time as usual, that we eventually went our separate ways. As my girlfriend and I were walking back home, my paranoia began to kick in, and I had a feeling that someone was following us. I glanced back slightly then, and sure enough, there was a guy dressed in full black. 
At first I thought it was one of my friends awkwardly following us, but I remembered then that none of them was wearing full plain black, so I turned back to my girlfriend and told her we were being followed. She glanced back slightly and saw the guy and started to panic, so I told her to stay calm as it was probably just some guy going to the subway as well. We arrived at the station and got on the train, hoping that the man would stop following us. But as I was making sure my rifle wasn't bothering anyone, I didn't have space to store it even when taken apart, so I had just slung it around my waist, and I felt my girlfriend's grip on my hand tighten. She whispered to me, saying the man was on the train and was staring at us. I'd had enough of this guy's crap by this point as I was tired. The last thing I needed was some dude stalking me and my girlfriend. But luckily our stop was only two stations or so away. So when we got there, we bounced the hell out of that cart. When I look back though, the man was again behind us. We went up the street, hoping that there'd be at least someone or some sort of camera that would be able to see me and my girlfriend, but they were basically empty, with only a couple of people going home themselves. My girlfriend was trembling beside me, scared to all hell, so I told her my plan, and with some hesitancy she agreed to it. I stopped walking to take a drink of water, and my girlfriend shifted her hand towards my leg, so it wouldn't be obvious. It was dark at the time, but then I heard her hand rip away from my leg and heard her terrified screams. I decided to grab the closest weapon I had on me, which was the stock of my Nerf rifle, which attached to Nerf guns with two clips latching onto them. It wouldn't take long to put it on or take it off, and my stock was pretty big and it wasn't metal, but was a solid piece of plastic that could do some damage to someone's face. So I whacked the guy, grabbed my girlfriend's hand and got the hell out of there. We then waved down the closest taxi, got in and sighed, happy that we weren't being stalked anymore. I don't talk about this incident much, but I just wanted to share it and get it off my chest. And since that incident, I stopped playing Nerf for a while and my rifle has been stored in my armory for a couple of years now untouched. Every time I think of Nerth, though, this incident comes to mind. I currently have a co-worker that really likes me. At first he was friendly buying me food and jewellery, etc., which I would decline, of course. But then he would just say that I didn't appreciate him, and the things he does for me is he really cares about me. I've been out to the bars with him a couple of times, and it's been fine. He doesn't try anything, not even a kiss, which I'm glad about because I don't have any feelings for him whatsoever. When we go out, it's just friendly, and he knew that I was seeing someone at the time. The last time my co-worker admirer and I went out for drinks, I paid so he didn't think I was using him. Then the night ended normally and uneventfully, and I ended up going to the guy I was dating's house and spent the night. Then the next day at work my co-worker came into my office and told me I looked hungover. I said I was, and he asked why as I'd only drunk a little, or did I go somewhere afterwards? I asked why it mattered to him, and that it was basically none of his business. Then he stormed out of my office, looking very angry, then texted asking me why I was lying to him, and why I kept things from him. I ignored this, because… what the hell? I never behaved like I liked him in that way at all, and he knew I was totally in love with the guy I was dating. Then I received another text that declared his love for me asking me why I was wasting my time with a guy that didn't value me. My boyfriend didn't love me the way he loved me, A message after message about why he loved me and how it was sad that my feelings for him weren't reciprocated. Again I ignored him, but he came into my office again and sat across from me, just staring. I asked him what he wanted and why he was staring at me, but he didn't say anything. I asked him to please not stare as I really didn't like it. Then he apologised, asking why I was ignoring him. And I said I was busy. Are you crazy? He said. What are you talking about? I asked. 
He began to laugh and walk out, and the whole exchange gave me the creeps. The way he just stared at me and the question. He also got mad when I couldn't hang out with him, going off on a rant. He wants me to be his, but I really don't like him, especially after all that weirdness from him. Again, when we hang out alone, he never made any advances towards me. He just acted normally. But what he did in my office, quite frankly, scared me. I've seen shows where guys become obsessed with a woman, eventually snapping and ending up killing her because his feelings aren't reciprocated. Maybe I'm just overthinking it all. I honestly don't know what to do other than find another job. But I really like it here. And he's been here for many years with our superiors favouring him. Am I overreacting? This all started when I was 14, when my mum met her new boyfriend, who I'll call Ray, for this story. I remember the first time he met me and my siblings, and he looked at my mum and said, Oh wow, didn't know you had a gang. Which, looking back, was a very weird thing for him to say, since he had been on a few dates with my mum beforehand, and she had told him exactly how many kids she had. Ray seemed like a normal guy at first, he was in his forties and had two older sons from his last marriage, who would sometimes come over for dinner. But things went wrong after he moved in. He would yell a lot, have loud arguments with my mum and throw things at her. But he would always sweet-talk his way around her afterwards, and this was probably why she didn't dump him sooner. My mum was crazy young when she had us, and she has always been a bit immature for her age so I think it made it easier for him. But Ray found it really difficult to get along with my siblings and me. He would complain about every little thing we did wrong, and quickly became very controlling and strict. But whenever we complained about how he was acting to our mum, he would accuse us of trying to ruin their relationship. This worked pretty much every time too, as it would cause her to get angry and yell at us instead of him. As we got older, he stopped us from seeing friends he didn't like, and wouldn't allow any friends to come over, unless they had his approval first. However, I realised he was actually crazy, when he picked me up from school one day, which he never did. And whilst driving home, he accused my sister and I of trash-talking him behind his back, and claimed that he had proof. When we got home, he showed me a tape recorder and played back a recording of my sister and I, complaining about him in our bedroom at night. I asked him why the hell he had put recorders in our bedroom, and we had a big argument. I immediately called my mum and told her, but later found out from her that she'd never actually said anything about it to him, which still gets me. I made him remove all the tape recorders from our bedroom, but I'm convinced that he still hides them, as he would sometimes bring up conversations that my sister and I had had whilst he wasn't around. We were so paranoid that we would whisper, and we never talked about anything private in case he somehow overheard. We were so terrified that he'd also hidden cameras as well as a tape recorder, so we would dress and undress really quickly, so if there were any cameras he wouldn't be able to see anything. It gets me angry thinking about the fear we went through whilst living there. When I was 16 I got a job at a fast food place, and Ray had a big problem with this as well. His reasoning for it was because my boyfriend at the time worked there, and he believed I was just going there to mess around with him. So his way of checking on me was to come and sit in the parking lot and record me, and he did this for an entire month. I was pretty much done at this point and moved in with my dad, who'd just moved back from New Zealand. My dad was pissed when I told him about everything that Ray had been doing, and he wanted to call the cops, but my mum begged him not to. They broke up a few years later, over something unrelated, so thankfully I never saw him again. So I've spent a lot of time in the woods in the dark, 
and it's a thrilling, unique feeling. There were some strange and scary moments, and this is one of the worst. But before I start the story, let me ask you this. Would you have done the following if you'd had the chance? So three of my friends and I were night walking on a track, surrounded by forest and cornfields. When in the distance we heard some voices, and saw some phone lights. We could see it was three people, and they were getting closer to us. We'd had plenty of time to prepare to put ourselves in the cornfields, so as soon as they'd passed us we made the corn move erratically, so it made a lot of noise. Another guy then made some noises, and the people then turned around and went back. But now for the real story. This next time it was my best friend and I having a nightly adventure in another nature region, and in the distance we heard a group of people having some kind of gathering. We couldn't see them as there was a steep hill in between us, but we contemplated doing the old scare routine again. But first things first, we did some scouting of the area. We made our way up the steep hill, and once on top of it we still couldn't see the people in the distance, only hear them. There must have been five different voices, and you need to be in complete darkness and silence for the prank to work. Then while standing on top of this hill, which was completely covered in bushes, we heard some rustling coming from below that was slowly but surely coming towards us. Whoever was making this sound was trying their best to be sneaky and slow. But already being in complete silence, you can hear every little noise. Twigs were breaking under their feet, and we could hear they were alone. We were now just sitting there, listening to whoever this was slowly stalking us. Any second they would reach us, and we could really feel their presence. I made some hand gestures to my friend to say that we should move as slowly and as quietly as possible over to the centre of the hill. As we went, this person was still coming towards us, so we thought forget it and stood tall making ourselves bigger than we were, then ran aggressively towards the noise. I yelled at my buddy to find the stalker, and for another twenty seconds we kicked bushes and looked around. We paused to hear any sounds our opponent might make, but there was nothing. We then made our way down the hill, hanging around for a couple of minutes, but there was no one there. So this story happened a long time ago, but being a hugely paranoid person from watching too many crime mysteries, I can't seem to shake it off. I was still in my early twenties, all alone, and it was one of the first real creepy situations I've been in. It was my sister's school graduation, and my family were all heading over to a hookah lounge. I passed up on it because I can't stand the smoke, so I offered to drop my little cousin home who was underage. I know the area really well, as as a family we practically visited our cousin's family weekly, and my alma mater was less than 15 minutes away. So with that being said, I finished dropping her home, and it was now probably a little past 10. Since it was a weeknight, the roads were emptier than usual, and I took the usual local road home that would have gotten me there in about 15 minutes. But there was this big, run-down looking pickup truck ahead of me that was hogging the turn lane that I needed to take, but was also going pretty slowly. Not thinking anything of it, me and my Nissan Altima Coupe signalled and passed the truck. I was busy changing my music and checking my texts, until I saw about 30 to 45 seconds later, the pickup truck had put on its high beams. I was in East Meadow, New York at the time, which was not only close to several schools, but also my college campus, and I thought to myself, oh here we go, some road rage. Underage kid is pissed, I passed them. I'd reached a pretty populated intersection, despite the hour, with a gas station to my right. I couldn't see who was in the car behind me, and the high beams were still on, so I was beginning to get unnerved, as they were literally two inches behind me, purposely close, I'm sure, to prove a point. In the back of my crime mystery buff mind, I was also thinking about how the Gilgus Island killer was never found, 
and how I totally fit the vulnerable female type at the time, being 5'4", 150 pounds, early 20s and long hair. I decided maybe I should test if this truck was really following me, or if it was just in my head. So I popped a ridiculously illegal U-turn, as at that point I was willing to get pulled over, and I saw that the truck was still going down the other side of the road. I let out a mental sigh of relief, and as I reached the next light in the opposite direction of home, I saw the truck actually had turned around and was heading in my direction. My paranoia kicked in full pelt, and I knew this wasn't normal and was too coincidental. If it was someone I knew from school or the area, they wouldn't mess with me this much, staying behind me and blasting the high beams like they were. I grabbed my phone and called my cousin then, who's a bit of a hothead but always very reliable, and his sister was the one I dropped off earlier, so he knew the area well. Him and the rest of my siblings and cousins who had left for the hookah lounge, I hoped were still there, as I turned down the street it was on. If I remembered rightly, it was about a ten minute drive from where I was. As if sensing the odd hour of the call, he picked up straight away. Hey, are you okay? He said. I'm freaking out. There's a pickup truck following me and I don't know what to do. I'm alone as I dropped your sister off already. I nearly cried out then, knowing I was still nowhere near him, and the roads were getting emptier and emptier. My cousin told me to get to the lounge as they were all still there, and he would come out with a baseball bat. I stayed on the phone with him and tried to lose the truck, but I felt like it was starting to turn into a game of cat and mouse. I cut off a red light illegally, again in the hopes a cop would pull me over or something, and I flew to the next light thinking there was no way this truck would follow. Oh, but it did, and it did it closely. But this time he moved to the lane beside me. I was literally about to start crying as my heart was pounding so hard I didn't know if I could even think straight. I was terrified of looking over at the driver in the truck next to me, as it lined up right in the next lane with the red light. I kept my eyes focused on the road, refusing to look over, but in hindsight that was probably pretty dumb because I wasn't really aware if the driver was getting out of the car or not at that point. I desperately reassured myself that I was in my car and the windows were up, so I should be safe. All the while I was still on the phone with my cousin. I was telling him exactly what was happening, as if it would somehow make a difference, and I booked it as soon as the light turned green. By this point I was flying down the road recklessly, illegally zigzagging and not putting on my signal so the truck couldn't follow me so easily. But of course the truck followed my every move, seemingly enjoying the chase even more. It occurred to me then what a weird person this was for putting in all this effort to harass me, from me just passing them to turn at a light. I told my cousin my every move. I'm flying down the road. I'm so scared this car is still following me. Are you standing outside? And true to my cousin's word, he was and I was now able to see him about 15 to 20 or so feet ahead of me. Don't worry, I'm outside and we'll be watching. Just park up as soon as you get here and go inside the lounge. I'll take care of it. Grateful for his help, I crazily pulled into the parking lot, thanking God I hadn't hit a car as I'd done so, because my nerves were out of control. I had purposely not signalled so the truck flying behind me wouldn't follow me, and I had absolutely no curiosity in seeing this driver, because I was so freaked out. The truck saw where I'd pulled in and immediately reversed backwards, pulling into the alley next to the lounge. I guess the trucker didn't realise the guy standing outside was my cousin, or connected to me at all. My cousin started staring down the trucker, and asked what he wanted. I was terrified and still sitting in my car, worried about my cousin and I had my phone ready to dial 911, but was also hoping against all odds that this wasn't one of those situations where I actually had to. Do you have a problem, bro? Why are you here? Come out, my cousin shouted, aggressively walking over towards the car. I was scared for my cousin at this point, who may be too hot-headed and not thinking about whether or not the driver in the truck was armed. Stop. Don't go near the truck. I just called the police and they're headed down here. I was lying, of course, 
although in hindsight this is exactly what I should have done right away. The pickup truck reversed once again down a one-way alley, then slowly wound down the window about five inches to flick a single cigarette through it. His high beams were now turned off, so I could identify it was a male, middle-aged, and just the type you read about as a crazy stalker. My cousin was still standing close to the truck, refusing to back off, when the trucker decided it was over and started to slowly drive away. My cousin and I both stared at him leaving until he was completely gone, and I finally got out of my car, and my cousin motioned for me to stay near the hookah lounge door. Then he walked over. We both agreed it was incredibly weird, but I was now able to relax. I was okay. Despite being shaken up and disturbed over the whole 15-minute nightmare situation, I still didn't think to call the cops. It was early 20s thinking, I guess, and being around a group of people again gave the illusion of security. Once we got to the others, both of us shared the story in turns, and the fear factor seemed to dissipate as the topic turned more comical than scary. I guess it helped my coping mechanism, as I'd just survived a weird stalker situation. But I will never forget the incident. I'm just so thankful I had family close by at a public location I could drive to. I do wonder who was following me that night and why. To this day, even though I'm now in my thirties, married and relocated out of New York, I keep replaying that moment at the lights where the pickup truck had pulled up right next to me, and was probably able to size me up and see me clearly in my small coupe. I sometimes wished I had looked over to see if the window was down and exposed the driver, and or been ready for whatever else that driver could have been preparing whilst I was stopped at that second light, staring stubbornly and foolishly straight ahead. We were legitimately the only two cars there. This happened to me about a year ago when I was 16 and was a sophomore in high school. Though I wasn't a senior, I was able to get early dismissal for the second half of my sophomore year since I've been taking classes a grade above mine and honours classes since I was in middle school. So I got to leave school about two to three hours before dismissal, and my school is only a five minute drive and a 30 minute walk from my house, so I live pretty close. Since I didn't have my license at the time, I had no choice but to walk, but it didn't bother me much, because not only is it a relatively short walk, and I like exercising, but my town is the safest residential area in my city, so I wasn't too worried. So one day I was walking home from school, and everything was pretty normal, until I got to the road that leads to the front of my house. I was able to see my house but it was still about a two minute walk until I actually reached my doorstep. However, as I'm walking, I noticed this white 4x4 Nissan Frontier coming from behind me, so I moved to the left of the street to make sure I wasn't in the way. But to my startling surprise, he stopped right next to me and rolled down his window. A grown Caucasian male wearing a cap, who seemed to be in his late twenties, began to talk to me in a tone that shook me to the core. The only way I can describe it would be if a stranger was trying to put you into a false sense of security and sound a little too nice. Hey there, bud. What are you doing? The man said, smiling slightly. Due to the sudden shock of the situation, I just stood there looking at the man for about five seconds, though it felt like an eternity. I just got out of school, I finally muttered to him. You just got out of school? he questioned, without the creepy smile leaving his face. Yeah, I have early dismissal, I said, my mind beginning to race. Oh, okay. He paused for a good few seconds. Are you selling anything? he finally asked. My heart immediately dropped and I started to internally panic, struggling to stay calm and keep my composure. Now in the man's defense, I was wearing an all-black outfit with an all-black hoodie over my head and a black book bag during the summer, so I can see how that was pretty shady. But given the circumstance I was in, 
and the fact that the truck of a stranger was only about two feet away from me, and that I wasn't actually selling anything illegal. This whole situation was horrifying. It's an understatement to say that I was terrified. I told him I wasn't selling anything, and he asked if I was sure, so I reiterated that I wasn't. He said okay, and he started to drive away. But the way he drove away gave me chills, and still does now. He drove very slowly, and if I had to guess, he was going about ten under the speed limit, and that was twenty-five miles an hour. I knew he was staring me down as he left, and this honestly made me fear for my life. I started walking down towards my house, but the man's truck still wasn't far away. I could tell he was looking at me to see where I live, but thankfully by the time I got to my driveway, the truck still hadn't disappeared from view. Because I was being blinded by fear though, I irrationally decided to book it to the door on the side of my house, and I should mention here too that I was the only one home at the time, as my younger brothers were still at school and my mum was at work. The moment I got inside I let my dogs out, because I know they would bark at any strangers, but in hindsight it was kind of a stupid thing to do, because then it would mean that the guy would definitely know I was in the house. I made sure to lock all the doors, and locked myself in my room. Then I immediately called 911 and tried to be as calm as I could, explaining to them what was happening. They sent a cop over, and whilst I was waiting for them to arrive, I called my mum and told her what was happening. She came home immediately, and while I was waiting for both the cop and my mum, I was listening closely to see if I could hear anything outside, and because of my paranoia the house noises I heard terrified me. The cop eventually came after what felt like an eternity, and asked what was going on. I explained to him what had happened, and he tried comforting me in an extremely nonchalant way which honestly sounded like he didn't even care. Now because of the way the policeman had acted, my mum assumed that the man I'd encountered was an undercover cop. But whether it was or not, this experience was by far the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. Though I like walking through my small town, I'm so glad I don't walk home anymore. And if that man wasn't an undercover cop, then I should consider myself extremely lucky. This took place in Maine in northeastern USA around 2007 or 2008. I was in third or fourth grade and just for fun joined the local community service soccer teams with my friends from school. Usually one of the parents of the team would be coach and another parent would act as an assistant. But on this day the assistant coach was sick so the community service centre sent in this other middle-aged older woman to take her place. Well, this day happened to also be one of our teammates' birthdays, who I'll call Mel, and she was having a big sleepover party where the whole team was invited. It was all we were talking about during the game, and Mel was a really close friend of mine. This would be the first time sleeping at her house, so I was really excited, as everyone else was. During the game, as I was talking to Mel about the sleepover party, the sub-assistant coach that I'd never met before called my name out and waved me over. Now I've always prided myself on having good intuition, and this was one of those moments it came into play. For some reason I'd just gotten a real bad feeling in my stomach, but I went over to her anyway, as I had to. However, as I stood about a foot away from her, she wiggled her finger in a motion to get me to come closer, and that's when alarm bells started going off even more. I leaned in just ever so slightly closer, as I was too uncomfortable to step forward. But I think she noticed I didn't want to step closer, so she leaned in too and whispered to me, I'm Mel's mum. I'm going to be taking you to the sleepover party after the game, so come right with me to my car as soon as the game is over, okay? Now I don't know why, but I felt really off about this. I hadn't met Mel's mum before and she was indeed supposed to be picking both me and Mel up, but it just felt wrong. So I stuck to Mel's side like Velcro for the rest of the game, 
and as soon as it was over, I told Mel that we should run to her mum's car and I'd explain why. So we took off in a sprint towards Mel's mum's car, and we both hopped in. But as our mum turned around, my eyes widened, and I said, Wait, are you Mel's mum? She looked confused and said something along the lines of, Yes, of course, why? And that's when my heart sank. Mel's mum was not the assistant coach stand-in lady, and I told Mel's real mum what had happened, which she was of course pretty concerned about, but never did anything about it that I know of. I told my family the next day, but only my grandmother believed me, so nothing ever got done to find this lady or figure out why the heck she was trying to impersonate my friend's mum to lure me into her vehicle. I just thought I'd share because this situation really stuck with me and I've always worried that she'd maybe try again and succeed with another child. I've since searched the internet for cases of children, particularly young girls around third or fourth grade going missing from school community service events, but I haven't found any that resonate with what happened to me. That doesn't mean they're not out there though. It was so creepy. I'll never know what she was planning to do to me, but I'm glad my instincts felt something was off and I really hope no other children fall victim. But what are the odds she'd never try that again? I don't know. It's just so strange. You have an idea in your mind of what creepers look like, but then an average-looking middle-aged woman comes out of nowhere to try and scoop you up. Now this story still haunts me to this day, and it takes place around ten years ago when I was around eight or nine. Back then I lived in a pretty crappy neighbourhood, in what was at the time a really run-down city. It wasn't good, but it wasn't bad at the same time. It just had a few bad apples in the tree. Now my friends and I loved to play outside, as it was really the only thing we could do. No one in the neighbourhood could afford any sort of electronics or fun toys, so we loved to just run around people's yards, cutting through houses, if they just so happened to leave their doors open. But looking back on it now, it was probably the dumbest thing that kids our age could have been doing in a neighbourhood like that. This story has nothing to do with running in people's houses though. I just wanted to let you know how dumb we were. Well on one fateful day we were playing hide and seek with four of us hiding and one of us seeking, and we thought it would have been a funny idea to go to the other side of the neighbourhood so that the seeker wouldn't be able to find us at all and we'd win. We liked to call that part of the neighbourhood the rich part because they had two-storey houses and a forest with a creek in it. So we were doing our usual thing, cutting through people's yards and jumping fences, when we heard the loudest scream about four to five houses down. After hopping off the fence we had just jumped, we all stopped and looked around, wondering where it had come from, when we noticed that one of our hiders wasn't with us anymore. Where's Isaac? I exclaimed. Then we heard the scream again. I pointed towards where the sound had come from, and we all jumped back over the fence and ran towards the scream. When we thought we'd gotten to the spot where the screaming was coming from, there was nothing there but an empty plot of land and the forest. We began to get scared. Did Isaac get lost in the forest? Did he get taken back there? Then we heard the scream again, and it was definitely Isaac. I decided to be the man of all the other eight-year-olds, and go into the forest to make sure Isaac was okay. As I started my way into the trees, I did one last look at my friends and saw how horrified they were. I knew at that moment that I was definitely the only one that could go down into the forest, and making my way in I could feel all the heat in my body fading and some sort of dread starting to take over. As I walked further in, it began to get darker and harder to see. I was whisper yelling my friend's name when I heard him respond in the most shaken up voice I've ever heard. Down here, be quiet. I finally got to him and asked him what had happened, and he told me the story of how he got tired of running 
and decided to take a break on the curb to catch his breath, and that instead of being out in the open and risking the chance of being caught, he decided to go into the woods and hide. He said that after about five minutes he heard talking, but it was nothing that he could make out, just random nonsense. He then looked around to see a man in a black hoodie hiding behind a tree on the other side of the creek and was staring straight at him. The man took off before my friend could even get up to run away, and this is where he said he'd started screaming at the top of his lungs and hid somewhere else in the forest, which is where both of us were now. But as soon as he told me this, we heard a twig snap. We looked up to see the man in some shrubs, and he was looking for us. I couldn't make out any facial features, but I could see he was holding some sort of blade. Now we needed to run. When the guy turned his back, we got up and started running, not caring how loud we were being. We finally got out of the forest and told all of our friends to run as fast as they could down the street, until we got to the other side of the block. We then stopped and all turned around to see that the street was empty. There was no one, not even a single car. Suddenly we heard a roar like a very loud engine in the distance, then shortly after, a silver 2000s Mustang with the darkest windows came peeling around the corner faster than I've ever seen a car go, and it was headed straight towards us. I've never had my body tighten up like it had at that very moment, when I could see it was the same guy from the forest. I told my friends to split up and run into people's yards to hide. So as we were all hiding, running through alleyways and jumping fences, we could still hear his engine but it was like he was targeting only me. I can't even tell you how fast and far I ran. I got to the point where I didn't even think I was in my neighborhood anymore. But I could still hear his engine coming up on me, so I ran further. I was exhausted. The sun eventually began to set, and I could hear his engine fade into the distance, almost like he had forgotten about me or had just given up. I started making my way back home, still absolutely terrified and checking my back every so often to make sure I wasn't being followed. Then once I'd made it home, I went straight to bed to cry myself to sleep. For months after that, that 2000 silver Mustang would follow us regularly, stalking every corner that we played on. We'd see it at our school, at the grocery store and I know it could have been a coincidence that our little minds are now perceiving things around us. But either way, I think he was definitely stalking us. Nothing actually came of it, and he never did what he'd done that first day. But it was still so scary seeing that car everywhere we went. I didn't know what or how to tell my mum, so I didn't, and still haven't. This story is for the people of this sub, and my four other friends only. And funnily enough, the Seeker didn't know what had happened until the day after, when we were at school and we told him. He still doesn't believe us, and says it was just to get inside so he'd be looking for us all night. So I'm not even exactly sure when it happened as it's been so long, but I would put it at a rough estimate of three to four years ago, and this incident occurred specifically around 10pm to midnight. It was a late and dark autumn night of running in the woods that was lit up by yellowed coloured lights, as the routes had been made for recreational hikers and runners. I'm a runner, I go very far distances, and I'm thin and fit and often mistaken as a girl. The story takes place in the woods where I used to run often in the dark. I'm not the type to get scared easily, except of my own shadow. Hell, when I see glowing eyes in the woods I often go and check them out, resulting in seeing some cool animals, such as badgers and raccoons. Now this trail specifically is well lit for about 30% of the route, with a ton of loops and shortcuts. However this night was a little bit different. I got a little spooked when I could see some bright lights coming from directly behind me. I turned round and even though was a bit blinded, 
I could see it was a van, very slowly crawling behind me. I thought to myself that I should yield and move to the side to give the van some room to move past me, but it could barely fit to begin with. Something in me told me not to stop and to just keep running, and I was pissed that the van had dared to drive through a pathway that wasn't designed for vehicles, so I stubbornly ran into the center. As time went by, I began to think that maybe I should just let him pass and go elsewhere, thinking that it must be a service car for the city, checking that the lights were working. But no, it continued right along with me, taking some questionable routes that no one would take. The van, about five meters at the closest to ten meters max, continued following me as I went for my second loop. That's when I knew something was really wrong but I never found out what it was. It was weird because the person never honked at me or made any aggressive gestures towards me to get me to move. All I can recall is that I lost the van by running onto a more narrow pathway into the woods. It was probably nothing, something that could be easily explained away, but it was sure as hell a weird experience. I've had a lot of other weird encounters being a late night runner but this was the one story that I'd forgotten about completely until today. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my video. And if you did, could you please give me virtual hugs by subscribing and clicking that notifications button. I also have a Patreon page and YouTube channel membership if you'd like to support me further. Thank you again for being here. Keep being creepy.